stand here or I can move? I need to move. I, I move a lot. And I can't control it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon, Simon. You call me the, the way you prefer. I'm a professor at the University of the Mountain. Uh, I'm pressing this button. Oh, there you go. So uh, for those of you who don't know, but most of you know where Mountain is, it, it's with, with a weird shape. It's way up there uh, in, 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 in Canada. And it's, it's straight north, straight north. We are, are, are on the same time zone, actually. So it's the same time right now in, 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 in Mountain. When I left my city, it was fall and it looked pretty much like this. And when I'll return in December, hopefully it will look like that. Because if not, it means it rains and it's really cold and it's I prefer the snow. So my uh, my laboratory at the University of Mountain study protein metabolism. I study all kinds of uh, all kinds of relationship between protein meta metabolism and, and, and the fish environment. Uh, hypoxia is one of those. And when I talk about protein metabolism, remove this chair. So when I talk about protein metabolism. I'm talking about this, this is a very old picture, but it's still up to date. So we are made, fish are made, animal, plants, most of the living things are made of, of proteins right here, and proteins are made of amino acids. All proteins are constantly being synthesized and degraded, and all the time there's this, this big, this, all the arrows here, it, it turns, so, so the amino acids are coming from the food, uh, they go in the free amino acid pool, they're sent be used to synthesize proteins and degraded and, 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 and resynthesize again. And all these arrows uh, require a lot of energy. It requires a lot of ATPs. Uh, so protein metabolism itself is very costly in terms of energy. And uh, you know energy is, is limited. So this is a fish uh, eating food and uh, it gets its energy from food. Uh, the energy is partitioned, so we call that energy <coughs> allocation. Some of the energy will be used for growth and storage, but some energy, uh, actually a lot of energy, will go to the basal cost, the basal cost of life. And protein, or most of protein metabolism, accounts for this basal cost here. If there's enough energy, what we call excess, well, it will go for growth, it will go for locomotion or playing around. Uh, but most of the uh, <coughs> energy go. Most of the energy goes there. When we talk about energy uh, extraction from the nutrient, we uh, talk about. I'm not going to go through all this, but you you, you already know most of this. Uh, here, as an example, glucose enters the cell. It goes through glycolysis, produces a couple of ATP, but not that much. If there is oxygen this part of it here will go into the mitochondria and then it will generate a lot of ATP. If there's no oxygen around, well, it finishes up there. So part of it is taken into fermentation and goes into something else like lactate, not producing more uh, ATPs. So the link between protein metabolism and oxygen is important because if there's not enough oxygen, the animals is not able to produce enough ATP to maintain high protein metabolism. So uh, they have to uh, take uh, they, ha they have to take strategies to uh, decrease ATP consumption during hypoxia. Well, actually, hypoxia events you know that better than me. Uh, we are in the Amazon. Hypoxic events are really frequent. It happens often in the aquatic environment, uh, and during hypoxia, fish will have to adopt different strategies to become to 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 to. Uh, to to spare ATP until oxygen returns, and these strategies will include in, in, increased ventilation, so they will breathe faster to extract more oxygen. They uh, will often remodel their gills to extract more oxygen from the environment, and they will also have uh, things like bigger heart and uh, increased cardiac output, so uh, they circulate this oxygen better uh, in their body. Many years ago, I assume it's in 26 still, uh, Bill came here with Joanne Lewis and Isabel Costa, and they uh, started looking at what's the effect of hypoxia on the rate of protein metabolism in Oscar, the same fish 
which we work here. And what they did is exposed for so many time. Uh, this is the oxygen concentration here. So they exposed the fish to hypoxic condition and they measured the fish metabolic rate. And what we see is when oxygen concentration becomes very low, the rate of uh, respiration, of metabolic rate decreases. And when oxygen comes back, oxygen, uh, the rate of the metabolic rate increase and um, the question was, what is the contribution of, of protein synthesis, like the diminishing decrease of protein synthesis to this decrease of metabolic rate? So they measure rates of protein synthesis in the same fish, same or different fish, but treated with the same conditions. And what they found was that during hypoxia, there's at least a 50% decrease uh, of the rate of protein synthesis compared to normoxia. This is just a condensed figure. This figure was much bigger. Uh, but it sets the stage to the first question when I came here with Bill and ECI in 2016. Uh, I was very interested by this uh, decrease in uh, rate of protein synthesis during hypoxia because in my head, it could come from two ways. One way is there's not enough ATP in the cells, so uh, synthesizing protein requires a lot of ATP, so maybe the cell, or the machinery that synthesizes protein is running out of ATP, so there's a decrease of uh, protein synthesis. Or maybe this is actively controlled, maybe there are signaling pathways decreasing the rate of protein synthesis during hypoxia. And we know, well, actually this is when we came, uh, I think here I'm trying to convince him not to buy this boat because <laughs> he was talking a lot about it. And this is at ECI, so the first experiment I'm going to talk about, actually most of the experiments I'm going to talk about today were done by Alicia Cassidy, who's done her PhD with me. And I think she's discussing nutritional choices with Bill. Mm -hmm. end up with an ice cream. <laughs> Since the first protein synthesis experiment on Oscar, from Bill and, uh, and his people at the time. Lots of cellular signaling pathways has been, have been described that uh, are uh, responsive to hypoxia. One of them is the unfolded protein response. I'm not going to go through all this. It's very complex for no, no good reason. But uh, during hypoxia, so this is the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. This is where the proteins are being synthesized. And proteins are very long strings of amino acid costs a lot of ATP to synthesize this chain, but you also have to fold it. It's, it it's, it's like a big ball most of the time, the proteins. And to fold it properly, you need also a lot of ATP. So if there's not enough ATP around, you will have accumulation of misfolded protein, and that will trigger the unfolded protein response. That will go through PERC here and then put lots of lots of uh, signals, but one important one is, is EIF2, because I'm going to talk a lot about this one. EIF2, during unfolded protein response, will be phosphorylated, and essentially what it does, it, 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 it inhibits protein synthesis, it inhibits translation of messenger RNAs. So we, uh, we, we try to uh, measure the phosphorylation of this uh, cellular signaling pathway. Another one that most of you know very well is HIF, uh, the hypoxia inducible factor. Everyone's tried to measure it. <laughs> and it's a very tough one to measure because the protein is not well conserved and all the, uh, all the, the antibodies that are available are for human or rat or mice. And they, they don't work in fish. So you, you can't, we can't really measure the quantity of protein. We go with RNA, messenger RNA. And or, 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 or transcript that are under the control of HIF. I'll talk about it later. HIF is a <laughs> yeah. HIF is a, a protein that is constantly produced, and when there is oxygen around, this molecule will uh, get oxidized by PDH2 here, and the oxidized HIF one will be recognized by VHL, and VHL will uh, attach ubiquitin to uh, this HIF, and there will be degradation by the proteasome. If there's not enough oxygen, HIF will be stabilized, 
and will move into the nucleus and it will uh, start its transcription activity. So it's very sensitive to uh, oxygen concentration. If there's not enough oxygen, it accumulates and start transcription of all kinds of genes. There's another sensitive, oxygen sensitive uh, uh, signaling pathway. Uh, it's AKT or mTOR, it changes the it doesn't change the name, but mTOR is here and AKT is upward. Uh, AKT and uh, AMPK, both pathways, can uh, turn down protein synthesis. So we also, uh, in the first case, we uh, studied AKT. In the second study, we uh, studied both AMPK and AKT. HIF, everything gets more complicated, I'll try to keep it simple. HIF and AKT have crosstalk uh, ways, so they, if, if one is activated, it deactivates the other one, so it can get complicated there. And it is the same for the unfolded protein response. It also talks with uh, AKT, and it's inhibiting or activating protein synthesis and autophagy in different ways. So it's, it's important to try to study a little bit of each of those pathways when, when we want to see what is under what is controlling uh, protein metabolism during hypoxia. So what we did the first uh, time I came here, uh, this is uh, this is this is this is Derek right there. I'm pretty sure it's Gino. I hope it's Gino. <laughs> this is Anisia. Uh, what what they did because uh, most of the time I was I was looking at what they were doing. We, uh, we took fish, put them in an aquarium, and then uh, gassed them with nitrogen for some time until uh, the air saturation or the oxygen saturation uh, decreased to 20%. And then what we did is measure the rate of protein synthesis in the fish that are at 20% saturation for some time, two hours. Here. Then we uh, decrease again the oxygen saturation and we measured uh, the rate of protein synthesis during this time, and then we re-inject again here at 5% saturation. So we have the rates of protein saturation, uh, the rate of protein synthesis at all of these saturation, and at the same time we were sampling different tissues to see uh, what kind of uh, activation we have of signaling pathways. And this is uh, the result for the rate of protein synthesis, and as was shown by by Bill and his team uh, back in the years. Uh, of course, it, it, let's, let's start with liver, it's the bottom right here. Uh, this is 100% saturation or in saturated water. What we see is a nice rate of protein synthesis. This is a 20% saturation. We already see a decrease, 10% saturation and 5% saturation. We, we see a huge response of the liver we see a pretty good response of the heart. We see a small response in the muscle. It is small, but it is important because the muscle is half the mass of the fish. So half of that mass is uh, muscle. If the muscle decides to decrease a little bit the traits of protein synthesis, it has a good impact on the fish. What surprised me big time was this number here. When I work with fish that live in cold water, and my, my fish are maintained at 10 degrees Celsius, and this rate of protein synthesis in the muscle is usually 1%, 2%, sometimes 3%. And here I got 0.1%, 0.15%, really, really, really low. So the big Oscar, if you want to think like this, the big Oscar is at a very, very low rate of protein synthesis in the muscle. And we have the gills here. So pretty much every tissue tissue respond to uh, to to uh, hypoxia. We uh, then uh, try to measure the activation of those signaling pathways. This is done with Western blood. In next week, I guess <laughs> you'll be you'll receive the equipment to do uh, Western blood. When we did that here, it was with like the old-fashioned way with films that are sensitive to light, and and, and I uh, spent a full week in a closet uh, in, in in the lab with lights off, trying to take those pictures. So it, it's it's really hard, but when you have the equipment, it would be a little bit easier. And basically, what we do is there is this uh, 4 EDP one that I was 
I didn't talk about it earlier, but I'm just going to show you where it stands. Well, 4-EBP1 is right here, just before protein synthesis. So AKD, when it's activated, it will activate the 4-EBP1. And to know if the protein is activated, it will be phosphorylated. So you need two antibodies, one antibody that will recognize 4-EBP1, the phospho version, and a second antibody that will recognize the, the, the all version of 4-EBP1, uh, and then we do ratio this band over that band. Uh, so this is for 100%, 20%, and 5%. And what, what we get is as oxygen concentration gets lower, we have dephosphorylation of 4-EBP1. So this, this band here pretty much disappears here. When this happens, protein synthesis is deactivated. There's a, almost a complete stop of protein synthesis. This is in the liver. We chose the liver because we knew it was going to be uh, super responsive. In the heart, we see the same trend, but it's, it's not as strong as here. But we see there's a, a, a decrease in phosphorylation of 4 EBP1. P, uh, for EIF2 alpha, I, I, I told you, is one of the proteins that are signaling in the unfolded protein uh, response. And EIF2 alpha, this one gets phosphorylated during hypoxia. Uh, this is not the best picture ever, but that's the one we could take. Uh, it, what you see is at 10% saturation and 5% saturation, th 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 there's a nice activation of this protein. And it's the first time we could uh, detect EIF2, the phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha during hypoxia in, in, in something that is not a mammal. So that's, that's, a, that's, that's a nice picture even though it's all crooked. So this work, I'm skipping parts of this work, but this work got published in 2016 and there's a lot of people in this room actually. Alicia is not here and, and, and Ad Alberto, but that's, that, that's it, everyone else is here. Um, what we show is that the rate of protein synthesis during hypoxia is actively controlled. So when the fish sense that there's less oxygen, it will, it will decrease rate of protein synthesis in, in several tissues, maybe not to the same extent in all tissues, but it will decrease rates of protein synthesis to spare ATP for when uh, oxygen comes back. Then I went back to Canada and I thought working with hypoxia was pretty fun because it was my first experiment with hypoxia. And in Canada, we said, well, we're going to try uh, working on a hypoxia sensitive species. The Oscar, you all know, the Oscar, they basically don't need <laughs> oxygen. They don't care if, you, if we decrease the oxygen concentration by a lot. While this fish is an Arctic shark, lives in super cold water, and it is, it's been described as the most intolerant species to hypoxia. It doesn't like hypoxia at all. And, and, and our question was, well, if we work with this fish, and we know that when we decrease oxygen concentration, they, 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 they will lose equilibrium, they will die real quick. Is it because they, they have lost their oxygen sensing pathway? Maybe, maybe they don't need them, maybe they, they don't have them. So we, uh, we tried to uh, see if we could find those oxygen sensitive pathways. And the other thing we wanted to know with this is now we know that during hypoxia the rate of protein synthesis is, is decreased, but we don't know much about protein degradation. And this is also very costly. Degrading protein proteins in a cell costs a lot of ATP, and if you degrade you have to resynthesize, so it's, 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 it's a lot of uh, energy spent there. So we looked at different uh, protein degradation pathways. Uh, that can get very complicated, but just, just, uh, just to give you a, a quick overlook, so there are two kinds of protein degradation, targeted and not targeted. Uh, the targeted uh, is by the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, and, and basically this, this protein is to be degraded. Uh, there's a, all kinds of machinery in the cell that will recognize this protein and attach this small green protein to it called ubiquitin. Uh, ubiquitin, ubiquitin is, is, is a flag uh, that when properly attached to a molecule, to a, a protein, uh, is a flag for destruction. It will be recognized by the proteasome and degraded into uh, small peptides and these peptides will be reused. The non-targeted uh, pathways are uh, the lysosomal catepsin, 
uh, cytosolic caffeines and uh, other proteases and, and many of them are uh, commonly put into a big bag that we call autophagy. So self-eating, autophagy is, is, is uh, super important with, especially for people doing cancer research. Uh, so we try to use their markers for this. Uh, one point that I really like to, 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 to add here is it, for a long, long time, people were thinking that protein degradation was random. Uh, so there was, you know, big pac mans in the cell eating protein and not being selective, but it's super selective. Uh, it's very, very uh, tightly regulated. So we thought that we could find uh, big differences in protein degradation uh, when, when, we, uh, when we play with uh, oxygen concentration. So basically what we did is the same, same plan. We wanted to have the same thing as uh, what we did when we came here. Um, the only thing we changed was uh, the oxygen concentration because we knew that at 5% saturation, the fish would be dead. So we did uh, 50, 30, and 15% uh, air saturation. But the temperature is cold, so there's more oxygen. So if I, if I, if I put it in, in mix per meter, uh, 50% is 6 mix per meter. That's almost my 100% here. So saturated water here is 7.2 today. Um, so 6% is, uh, not 6%, but 6 mix per meter is 50% saturation. And 15, this treatment was extreme. The fish started to be tipsy uh, at 15% uh, air saturation, and it's close to 2 uh, mix per meter. So this fish doesn't like uh, hypoxia at all. We uh, measured, to make sure that the fish was hypoxic, uh, we measured the plasma uh, lactate production and if you look at 50% air saturation, we already see an increase in uh, lactic acid in, in, in the plasma. So this, this means that the fish is already uh, a little bit hypoxic and in the, in the liver we have the same thing here. We have we already have lactic acid at 50% saturation. We measure the rate of protein synthesis in many tissues. And we like to do many tissues because they don't respond all the same way. Uh, the gills responded exactly the same way as in the Oscar. So they decreased, minor decrease, not too, not too big. Uh, the liver respond also the same way as in uh, the Oscar. Liver and digestive system. So we took the whole digestive tract and measure rates of protein synthesis in there, and we got the same thing. Uh, this means that the, the, they are controlled by the same mechanism. And what what we think is that the the, the blood flow stops to these tissue when when oxygen gets too low. Uh, we measure in white muscle. We got the same thing. Uh, red muscle. We didn't do it with the Oscar. We a similar thing. Uh, but then we measure in the heart, and in the heart we see a trend for decrease and then there's probably one spot, one fish that was higher here, but there's no big trend. Like the, the heart maintained its rate of protein synthesis in, in this fish, fish species compared to, to the Oscar. We looked at the activation of different cell signaling pathways in, in, in the liver, muscle, and heart. And what, what you see in the liver already at 50% saturation, uh, it's already a little bit higher, significantly higher for AMPK. AMPK will sense the ratio between ATP and AMP, so it will it will it, it will be activated very quick when oxygen comes low, and the fish are already running out of uh, energy uh, in the liver at 50% saturation. In the muscle, there's no big big trend, and the heart. I, I, it's a really funny. Uh, shape curve at saturation we have some phosphorylation at 50% saturation it's much 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 lower it's not significantly different but it's, it's very tight here and 30% uh, and 15 well, is coming back up this is for AMPK the same thing for uh, 40 BP1 uh, in the liver we uh, at fifty percent we don't see, no it's not the same thing actually in the liver it it it, it, change, it takes a lot of time to be uh, different in the muscle it's also taking a lot of time to be different and in the heart 
the, the same trend. So AMPK is more sensitive to hypoxia than uh, this uh, mTOR pathway here from 4EBP1. The activation of the uh, unfolded protein response is similar, uh, not activated at all here at 50% and 100% saturation. At 30% we start seeing a little bit of signal, but really it's at 15% saturation that we see a big signal in the liver. So we, again, it's not a major, major root of, of, of uh, disactivation of, of protein synthesis in the liver. Uh, same in the muscle. And in the heart, we have this smiley shape here, uh, a little bit higher at 100% saturation at 15. And at 50 and 30, it's, it's, it's a bit lower, and we, we, it, it's hard to explain. Uh, lower here means that protein synthesis is maintained, or even maybe activated. Then we wanted to measure <coughs> markers of protein degradation, and this is really, really hard. Measuring protein degradation and which way it's going uh, is, is very difficult. So what we uh, chose to do was to measure the transcript number of different, I'll move this way, of different uh, transcript involved in the proteasome pathway, the calpine pathway, or the autophagy, and we just measured like how many mRNAs are in there uh, during hypoxia. So, and we have it that 100% saturation, 50, 30, and 15. And I'm not going to do all this, but one thing I want you to see here is that 15% saturation. Most of these numbers here, when there's little letters next to it, they're they're higher than one. It means that these transcripts are over represented during hypoxia. This is for liver. Now I'm going to show you heart. The same transcript, the same fish, the same hypoxia. In heart, they are decreased. And most of the time, it's the same, uh, the same transcript. So during hypoxia, it's an acute hypoxia. During hypoxia, the transcript number is lower in the heart, which for, for the protein degradation and this seem to indicate that they want to degrade less protein. <laughs> Swimming. <laughs> so this is the paper I sent uh, before, before my talk, uh, just, just published. So it shows that uh, proxy sensitive uh, cellular signaling pathway are also activated and present in, in Arctic char or in hypoxia sensitive species. Uh, we see all of the, 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 the classic uh, <coughs> oxygen sensitive uh, pathways. And the transcript of protein degradation pathway are highly tissue specific. It changes <coughs> among tissues. These experiments I showed you were all we take fish and we acutely expose them to, uh, to hypoxia. So it's one event of hypoxia. And everything we measured was during hypoxia. So I just showed you, well, the, the transcript number change, but protein synthesis is also almost arrested in most of these tissues. So even if the transcript are there, the protein is not there. So it's, it's, we, we have no idea what's happening with this fish uh, later on. So uh, I started to get very interested in cycling hypoxia. Uh, this is a, 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 a figure taken from a, 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 that's in an estuary, but it's, it's not important that you have it here, cycling hypoxia. So this is over the course of a year, and there's a little gray zone here that is expanded there. And, and what you can see is very often you'll find places where oxygen concentration is uh, high during the day, then it decreases during the night, and it, it cycles like this uh, a lot. So nothing is very stable like we like to do in our experiment. We control everything, everything is stable. In, in real life, it's not stable. So we started playing with that. Uh, Emily Bolutsky did her master's thesis on this. She's almost done now. And uh, what she did was uh, take the Arctic chart and make them cycle like this. So this is the uh, oxygen concentration in mix per liter this time. So we start at 10 during the day. We decrease at, I don't remember, 
remember the number two and two and a half uh, during the night, and then we uh, bring it back up. And she measured the rate of protein synthesis during the uh, hypoxia event here. She also measures it here and there, and later on she does that for some days. And she also measured during the recovery, like she inject the fish right here, so she starts the measurement of rate of protein synthesis just there, and then she brings the oxygen back up. So if there is a compensation of rate of protein synthesis, she uh, would be able to, to get it right there, and she does that for all the cycles. What she got is this. I took just two tissues, but she did it in many, many tissues. Uh, the little bars here are during hypoxia. So there's no surprise during hypoxia. At the first cycle, there's no surprise. During hypoxia, the rate of protein synthesis decreases by a lot. The first maybe surprises, even after 10, day, 10 cycles of going like this, the liver and every other tissue, they maintain very low rate of protein synthesis uh, during hypoxia. When oxygen comes back, it's the white bar, when oxygen comes back, we see a massive compensation of the rate of protein synthesis on the first cycle. We see it on the second, we see it on the third, and then uh, it disappears. And most tissue do it. So we have heart, same thing here, heart higher, oh, and I forgot to say why I say it's higher. The black bar is controlled. So it's fish maintained in the same conditions but without hypoxia. So the control fish, uh, they, they're pretty stable. And when the bar, the white bar goes above control, above the black bar, it means that there is something happening. We, we, we calculated this increase of rate of protein synthesis. Basically, what we did is we calculated the proportion of this. Uh, that's above this one, and we, uh, we, we calculated what we call an excess post-hypoxia uh, protein synthesis. And what we see in most tissues is that it's, there is an excess for the first few cycles, and then it disappears. Excess for the first few cycles, and it disappears. This is very, very similar to what you know as excess post-hypoxia uh, oxygen consumption that we have here. This experiment is from, it's another experiment from, uh, you know, Tyson McCormack. So it's with Tyson McCormack and they had fish cycling like this. So this is oxygen, oxygen concentration here. And the bottom here is uh, metabolic rate. And when oxygen goes down, metabolic rate goes down. And when oxygen comes back, there's, there's a little bump here. And then it goes to, it returns to normal. And then oh, another bump here and a lesser bump. They calculated what's, what's the uh, excess post hypoxia oxygen consumption and the first reoxygenation, there's a big one. And the second one, there's also a big one. And the third one, not as big. The fourth one, it's almost disappeared. And I guess if we were, if they had gone 10 days, it would be pure flat. So I uh, suggest this suggests that there's a big, big link between what we observe here, like the excess uh, rate of protein synthesis during reoxygenation, and the excess uh, oxygen consumption during reoxygenation. And the ultimate question would be to know what's the contribution of protein synthesis in this. I uh, hoped to uh, be able to, to answer this question, this question here. But that would be very, very complicated, technically not possible. The other question that obsesses me, I'm just going to return a little bit here. They are synthesizing more protein, like a lot more here, almost twice as much. But we don't know that the assay I'm doing, uh, I'm, 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 I'm doing is not telling me what they are synthesizing. Is it? Is it? more animal, like all of the protein, or is it just one kind of protein? Is it HSP? It could be HSP-70. And there's no really good way for now to, 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 to measure that. We could say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and buy a ton of antibodies and try them all. Or we can uh, use a different approach. 
and this different approach is uh, something that will be used by uh, my new PhD student, uh, Loïc, Loïc Ducro. Uh, Loïc will focus on what protein are being synthesized, what well, part of his thesis will be that. And basically what he will do is having fish cycling like I described, but he will compare the fish at the beginning and the fish at the end and control and treatment. So fish that will stay in the system for one month with no oscillation and fish that will stay in the system for one month with 30 oscillation. And he will compare uh, all of the proteins at once with an approach that we call metabolomics. It's, 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 it's very expensive, it's vastly complicated, but it will uh, eventually give us a list of proteins that are deregulated after these cycles. And the hypothesis is the fish, after a few cycles, like we had here, after so many cycles, the fish has changed its phenotype and he has different proteins, different organizations <coughs> of its cells. Uh, and this will be maintained. So we, we that's that's the major uh, question from uh, Loïc's thesis. And before uh, I have these uh, results, I may have to come back and then show them to you because it's ongoing. The fish are cycling. Hopefully, they're cycling as, as we speak today. Um, I showed you a lot of data, and most of this data is not mine. Obviously, uh, Alicia Cassidy produced most of it. Uh, Derek and Gino help us a ton when uh, we came here. Uh, Bill, help, oh, he's always helping. Always sleeping. Emily Bolotsky and Loïc, that are my students that are uh, keeping the fort in, 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 in Canada. And uh, indeed, uh, at Alberto and, and, and Vera uh, for having uh, us here. Well, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>